now for our next session i would request dr rajiv garg sir dr ram babu sir dr upali malik ma'am and dr smita dawari manjavkar ma'am to moderate the discussion on metabolic liver disease and diabetes mellitus and newer concepts in diabetic nephropathy the first topic is on newer concept in diabetic nephropathy and to speak on this topic we have dr sahil from max hospital dr sahil please Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I'll uh, like to thank uh, Diabicon and uh, Dr. Anupam especially, who has been my mentor over decades now, and all the organizers for inviting me for a talk on uh, newer concepts in diabetic nephropathy. I am Dr. Sahil. I am uh, currently practicing in Max Saket as a nephrologist. So I think <coughs> over the last uh, 36 hours, there would have been many uh, uh, talks about uh, diabetes and uh, the epidemiology and the new sense it's causing on uh, in all the health cases. So this is just a slide depicting what the new science it causes. So if you see all the arrows in the different areas, you see the, there is an upgoing arrow in all the areas. Whether we talk about North America, you talk about South and Central America, you move to Africa, you move to Middle East, you move to Southeast Asia, you move to Europe. There is uh, uh, no arrow which is down trading. This shows the new science uh, diabetes is causing all around. When we particularly talk about Southeast Asia, look at the numbers. It's a humongous uh, increase in what uh, in last about 10 years and it's believed that uh, even in next 30 years the rise is going to be staggering. Specifically talking about India, so uh, the prevalence of diabetic individuals in our country as of now is about 10.4 percent and the diabetic population estimated is about 77 million. India is uh, home to the second largest of adults with the diabetes worldwide currently. Talking about uh, uh, chronic kidney disease and diabetes. So this is just a tip of an iceberg. This is a study which has been taken from Indian Journal of Diabetes um, um, Metabolism 2017. It enrolled about 3,000 patients and it just uh, was an observational study uh, pointing where what's the exact number of people with the staging of uh, chronic kidney disease. So they found that major population was in the stages 2 and 3 with the minor population being in uh, stage 5 and stage 4. So when we look in the West, the pictures are almost similar. Diabetes uh, is the most leading cause of uh, chronic kidney disease even in the West. So what has happened to the comorbidities associated with diabetes over uh, say about two decades? So you see there have been great advancement in cardiology and we have seen that the risks of acute MI has come down. We have, we have seen that the stroke management has improved uh, uh, significantly, so the numbers have come down. People have got uh, more aware and the physicians, uh, endocrinologists uh, uh, dealing uh, with the uh, peripheral vascular disease have uh, become uh, more and more smarter and they identify the uh, peripheral vascular disease early. So the rates of amputation have come down. Look at the slope of the end stage renal disease, it's a creeping slope downside and the numbers has not made a huge difference even in two decades. That's where we are. So talking about uh, CKD uh, burden in relevance to our uh, uh, region. So talking about CKD burden, burden in low and middle income countries, look at the numbers. We, are, uh, we have about 8436 million uh, people with chronic kidney disease as of 2017. So it's estimated that 1 in 10 person would have uh, chronic kidney disease amongst the diabetes. It is going to be more prevalent in individuals with high poor control of diabetes, racial minority, elderly, individuals with long-standing hypertension and uh, females has been one of the uh, uh, temporarily seen to be associated with increased risk of chronic kidney disease. And it's believed that uh, by 2040, it would be the fifth largest cause of uh, death in uh, our uh, set of countries. We Asian are uh, naturally somehow predisposed to higher incidence of ESRD. So the worst population with uh, dealing with diabetes would be Africans, then would be the Asian and uh, then would be the other population. So inherently we are at risk for some kind of a predisposition to have some kidney uh, dysfunction. This is just to uh, put a slide here for the cl uh, uh, classes of uh, chronic kidney disease wherein uh, they are divided into five stages from G1 to G5 and then based on your protein excretion, A1 to A3, A3 being the highest one and G5 being the worst uh, GFR. So talking about diabetic uh, nephropathy, so at the outset I like to uh, just uh, uh, break two th uh, things and keep two terms uh, uh, differently which are interchangeably used in clinical practice uh, at times. So diabetic kidney disease and di diabetic nephropathy per se are not uh, interchangeable disease. They, uh, there is a multitude of difference between the two terms. 
Loosely speaking, diabetic nephropathy would always be diabetic kidney disease, but diabetic kidney disease would not be diabetic nephropathy. So when you call someone diabetic nephropathy, I would believe that everyone is believing that uh, there is a pers there is albuminuria in that patient. There is a progressive decline in EGFR, and there has been an increase in the blood pressures. And that's just because the glomerular uh, leakage has been there, and there has been protein accumulation in the Bowman space, and subsequently would be leaking in the urine. Diabetic kidney disease uh, differs from uh, diabetic nephropathy in a sense that it would include patients who might not have albuminuria, but uh, would have uh, decreased GFR, that's less than 60. So these patients can be qualified and still called a diabetic kidney disease, they need not uh, have protein. So that's what uh, the latest uh, literature has been citing that uh, uh, even type 2 diabetics have major percentage of patients who have not had albuminuria. So you can't say that these patients are not uh, having uh, uh, diabetes as the cause for their uh, chronic kidney disease. So talking about pathophysiology in just a uh, nutshell, so we know that diabetic milieu is going to cause uh, accumulation of AGs, there would be hemodynamic changes, there would be growth factor release, there would be hormonal changes. As a, re as a result, glomerular hyperfiltration, altered glomerular composition, renal hypertrophy, glomerular hypertension, these all lead to albuminuria deposition of extracellular matrix, ultimately glomerular sclerosis and IFTA, which is called interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy. So uh, this is the classical uh, description which was uh, given by Mogensen et al. Uh, th uh, this is generally limited to type 1 uh, individuals. Uh, difficult uh, to say what uh, stages of diabetic nephropathy would a type 2 present with. But classically speaking about class 1, they are supposed to, they are believed to pass through four stages. So uh, th th it would be a stage wherein the patient and patient might not know that he has had uh, some trouble to the kidney. Here the uh, glomerular size increases, glomerulomegaly happens, there would be thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. At this stage, the microalbuminuria starts to happen, but the patient would take another five years to significantly note the changes in the microalbumin level. So at this stage, uh, when already five years have elapsed in his diabetic history, that's the time when people usually present with microalbuminuria. At this stage, when the structural changes are seen, there would be further GBM thickness and there would be mesangial expansion. This is again, this again is a honeymoon period for the diabetics where in 5 to 15 years they still enjoy uh, not, not having uh, increase in creatinine and uh, in turn that's the uh, worry which as a nephrologist I always have that uh, most of the patients when they present in this stage uh, usually don't get micro assessment done. Then these patients land up in trouble later on and then we have very limited to offer to these individuals. So from 50 to 25 years is a stage when they'll go through macro area stage and ultimately to end stage renal disease state. state. So when someone lands to you in OPD and you say that the patient has diabetic nephropathy, so these are the point, these are the pointers when we can say that patient will be presenting with a glomerular involvement in a, a diabetic disease, a di uh, diabetes. There would be a swelling of hand and face, there would be nausea, vomiting, which would happen in the later stages of obesity. There would be difficulty in concentration. There would be dry, itchy skin. There might be some irregularities in the heart rhythm or atrial fibrillation. That's the most common uh, rhythmic disturbance which we come across in the OPD. Fatigue and insomnia. So now having talked in nutshell about the pathophysiology, the clinical presentation, that now is, is the time how do we manage our patients. So in nutshell, there are going to be five things which everyone needs to follow. So first is going to be glycemic control. It's The second is going to be hypertension. The third is going to be other strategies which would include lifestyle modification. Fourth or fifth would be protein urea, uh, protein urea reduction. And the fifth would be to deal with the aldosterone breakthrough. So talking about glycemic management, so uh, this uh, pyramidal uh, representation has recently been adapted by KDGO in the, and has been dis uh, uh, circulated as a public uh, draft amongst the masses. So as rightly put across, the, the bottom of the pyramid is going to be formed by the lifestyle changes. So we often uh, tell our patients uh, in OPD, be uh, punctual with the kind of diet they take, be regular with the exercise, smoking cessation is something which we advocate for. And we, uh, check on, uh, uh, keep a check on your uh, weight is what we always stress upon in every visit. Once the lifestyle changes have been incorporated in the uh, uh, patient's uh, life, we moved on to something which is going to be the heart and soul of the therapy, which is the first line uh, drug therapies. So in this, the metformins, which have been the backbone for almost like five decades are offered. SGLT2, obviously with the uh, surge in the trials, it has given uh, leaps and bounds of confidence to uh, everyone in the hall. And I, have I think it has almost become uh, at par with views of metformin these days. 
RAS blockade always has been the backbone for uh, treating hypertension and statins. Once you reach the, when once you introduce first line therapy, then comes the uh, aim to fine tune the therapy. So fine tuning would mean you introduce GLP-1 receptor agonists, you use non-steroidal MRAs, you otherwise you manage antiplatelet by uh, lipid management, which is just going to be a supportive case. So talking about uh, di diabetes and uh, chronic kidney disease, so as I said that uh, for almost like uh, five decades, we know that uh, metformin has been one of the uh, key agents of use for everyone. With the, the up, uh, upcoming, with, with the <coughs> uh, available trials like uh, DAPA-CKD, MPA kidney, the confidence given by these trials to uh, the nephrologist cohort especially is uh, very reassuring. So as of now, we can say that SGLT2 inhibitors can be initiated in patients with EGFR more than 20. And metformin, obviously, the GFR cutoff would always be 30. So if the, the patient's HbA1c is still uh, not a target range, the next go-to agent now, now would be GLP-1 receptor agonist. When dealing with hypertension, we know RAS are the backbones. If someone's blood pressure is not controlled on that and uh, RAS uh, inhibitors and someone still has proteinuria, now uh, the next go-to agent would be non-steroidal MRAs. We'll talk about this. Otherwise, uh, dihydropyridine uh, and diuretics can be used on individual basis. For uh, uh, lipid management, in, uh, high dose statins can be used. If the statins have not been able to control, then azotemide can be used to control the cholesterol level. Triglyceride levels, if high, can uh, the then use of uh, uh, other agents can be used. So uh, uh, I'll uh, not be uh, wasting too much of time time on the trials uh, with the diabetes. We all know that there have been uh, uh, these are landmark trials. I don't think uh, uh, I need to go in details about them. DCCT addict had uh, uh, posed uh, significant uh, confidence in everyone that the intensive diabetic uh, management is uh, good for uh, patients and that gives good amount of reduction in micro albumin, uh, micro complications and macro complications. There was a study which was done in veterans in US, a COD study. This again compared standard uh, versus intensive therapy. The downside of the uh, trial was that they noted that there were uh, significantly more mortality in the intensive group. However, the other uh, UK PDS in type 2 and uh, DCTT addict in type 1 did give us good confidence that intensive therapy is what is uh, to be followed. Talking about uh, not uh, same shoe size can fit all. So even the KDGO accepts this and it says that uh, individualization of HbA1c targets has to be done as per the population you are dealing with. So for me, when, once a patient walks in my clinic with uh, stage 1 and stage 2, I'll uh, just consider, consider him as a normal diabetic and I'll try to maintain a HbA1c of uh, uh, maybe if not lesser than but equal to 6.5. But someone who works in my clinic at uh, later stages of chronic kidney disease 4 and 5, I am very, very apprehensive in reducing their HbA1c's. And I'll keep a HbA1c near about 7 to 8 for these patients. And uh, if someone has a shorter life expectancy, you don't need very uh, stringent uh, sugar control. If someone's hypoglycemic awareness is not much, you don't target the values, you target the individual. So coming on to the hypertension control. As I've been talking about, that RAS blockers have found uh, the backbone for almost a uh, good number of years. KDGO, after the sprint trial, uh, advocated intensive blood, sugar, uh, blood pressure control and it has imbibed that all the levels should be less than 120, irrespective of the disease uh, or etiology we are dealing for chronic kidney disease. So they say that if possible, try to maintain a blood pressure of less than 120 in all these uh, patients. So earlier changes were like if you have a protein urea of more than 1 gram, you maintain it 130 by 80, but KDGO has given away with all this and there is a standard uh, goal now that uh, 120, less than 120 is what we aim for in all kind of patients. So there is an apprehension uh, uh, in most of the people when they uh, deal with ACE inhibitors or ARPs. As, and as the learning has been progressing, the fears have come down in l a larger population. So once you initiate ACE inhibitors, uh, you monitor the KFTs and hyperkalemias after four weeks. 30% rise is what is acceptable. If that's the, if you are within range, it's good to continue these medicines. If the rise is more than 30%, that's where you try to look for other causes. If not, then you will have to consider to uh, reduce or stop uh, ACE inhibitors. So coming on to the other strategies, as I told, these are supportive care. So in, uh, anti-lipid management, lifestyle modification. So coming on to proteinuria regression, 
it's seen that patients who have progressed to severely increased albuminuria had, had the highest level of uh, fallen uh, GFRs. So once you see a patient has progressive protein urea, that's the time when the GFR starts to decline even uh, faster per day. So the degree of albuminuria is not always necessarily linked to the disease progression, especially in diabetes. As I said that they can, may be individuals who might not have protein urea or albuminuria. That doesn't mean that they will not progress. The progress would be lesser than to the vis-a-vis -vis albuminuric patients, but they too will pro progress. The rate of loss of GFR was lower in patients who had regressed to a previous stage. So microalbuminuric patients turned to normal albuminuric, had a better uh, uh, GFR uh, uh, slope versus one who retained microalbuminuric stage. And people who failed to come down to the microalbuminuric stage uh, did the worst. Talking about aldosterone breakthrough. So uh, this is an important slide uh, which I just tried to so show that it, it, whatever we believed in uh, all these recent years, all these uh, landmark trials did show that in spite of the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which were the backbone, there was a percentage of residual risk which was remaining in these patients. So there, there comes the concept of aldosterone uh, breakthrough. In, in patients whom we are using ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we know that the aldosterone uh, action would be inhibited because you are uh, inhibiting the enzyme. But somehow these, uh, in these patients, the aldosterone levels still remain to be high. So once the aldosterone escapes the breakthrough, it promotes tissue inflammation and fibrosis. Uh, at this po uh, point, I would say the screening for aldosterone breakthrough is uh, uh, not uh, mandatory or recommended as there is not strong evidence to supp uh, support the screening at this point of time. However, there uh, have been uh, studies and uh, <coughs> there have been research in these areas where people have tried to block the aldosterone apart from ACE inhibitors and ARB uh, blocking. So there comes the newer approach, which we call as a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. The, and the new drug is non-steroidal. We know that spironolactone and aprilinone has been in the market for too long, but as a nephrologist, I have also not been very keen on using them. But with the advent of phenylalanine, uh, it has given at least some advantage for us, wherein we can offer an ad additional benefit to our patients who are specially albuminuric. It's a bulky, non-steroidal molecule. It has a higher selectivity and higher potency for the mineral corticoid receptor. These are the trials which were uh, uh, done, ARTS trial, these, uh, where the uh, uh, molecule phenylalanine was compared to the compar existing comparators, spironolactone, aprilinone, placebos, and it was found that uh, the risk for hyperkalemia was less with phenylalanine. There was reduction in the heart failure, uh, HFRF incidence was lesser when used uh, in these patients. So then came uh, two landmark trials with MRAs. These were Figaro and Fidelio uh, trials. The astonishing uh, thing about the trials was that the primary outcome for one was the secondary outcome for the other trial. So I'll just be dealing with the Fidelio here. So Fidelio composite outcomes were catery failures with more than 40% decrease in GFR over a period of four weeks period or death from renal causes. And secondary composite outcomes were Figaro's primary outcomes, which was death from uh, cardiovascular causes or hospitalization from any. Over a median uh, period of 2.6 years, they saw that uh, this uh, uh, helped in uh, relative risk reduction of, of about 18% uh, in the primary outcomes and 14% uh, in the secondary outcomes. And hence, it, it got the FDA approval. So what the guidelines now recommend is that you initiate your RAS and uh, ACE inhibitors, reach the full strength of your RAS and uh, ACE, uh, ACE inhibitors as what maximally tolerated doses can allow you. If your patient still has the poor BP control or you see that the patient is having albuminuria. Dr. Sahil, so, please go and Yes. Uh, move to HGLT2 inhibitors. And if uh, your hyperkalemia is and your creatinine values allow, then move on to uh, the, the drugs, ferinone, which is marketed as Kerentia. So talking about HGLT2, I think there have been landmark trials which had uh, given us good uh, confidence again. So with uh, dapagliflozin, 31% risk reduction was there with all-cause mortality, 39% with uh, especially looking for the primary outcomes in terms of kidney. Talking about um, EMPA kidney, I'll just like to stress that all the trials before the EMPA kidney were including patients who had some kind of albuminuria. This was the only trial which had uh, kept an inclusion criteria where even patients who had more than 20 GFR but no albuminuria, that's, that's where the significant number of diabetic population was uh, excluded in the previous trials were included. And the results were astonishingly supportive. That 28% risk reduction happened with the progressive CKD or CKD deaths in EMPA uh, kidneys. 
So the primary out, and uh, I'll just like to say, say that the primary outcome as uh, in almost all the trials before this were similar, but here the GFR was taken as less than 10. Summarize, please, please yes. summarize your talk. So I'll just say that uh, in the last I kept GLB-1 receptor again. So I'll just like to show this uh, as the last slide, that these are all the existing GLP-1 molecules. There have been uh, not, the, the uh, kidneys outcomes have all been part of a secondary analysis and uh, there has been seen that all these hint that uh, new onset micro -album, macro albuminuria and doubling of creatinine was lesser with these agents and they had some propensity to cause some delay in the end stage renal disease. This was a trial where dulaglutide was compared with insulin and it showed that uh, these patients uh, did well in terms of reducing their EGFR and uh, pushing them to uh, dialysis. Sorry. So okay. the ongoing trial is a slow trial which includes uh, uh, oral semaglutide. So the take home messages would be that uh, once you have your patient in the clinic, start with RAS inhibitors I have said. Keep taking your creatinine and potassium as per your convenience, but should be uh, not, should not be ignored. Once your patient is still albuminuric, move on to SGLT2 inhibitors. I have just, these were the papers before the NPA kidney, so the GFR cutoff was 25. Now it's 20. So once you have your patient who has more than 20 GFR, please be confident enough to start with these medicines. Pinenone, as of now, has only been uh, given to non uh, type 2 diabetic patients with EGFR more than 25, and GLP-1 as of now have been given to type 2 diabetics with EGFR more than 50. There has been a trial uh, and Max is one of the centers, find CKD, wherein we are now trying to see that phenylalanine can be used in non-diabetic population even. So we might have uh, FDA approval for uh, phenylalanine even in non-diabetic kidney uh, patients. Uh, I like to thank everyone for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Sahil, uh, for delivering a brief talk on the nephropathy. I think uh, proper education of the patient before starting the treatment of diabetes, adherence of the pharmacology therapy very, uh, along with the diet, CKD diet is very important. <laughs> Sometimes, most of time patient uh, doing the window shopping, Ayurvedic, Hemopathic, increasing the disease. So this is the very.